And our first presenter is Dr. Brian Nakazoni. He's a Jabsom graduate, so we're very proud that he returned to Hawaii uh, after his fellowship at Scripps to practice here at home. And he does have a booming practice. Jabsom folks love Ryan and truly appreciate his many contributions to the school. We also call him a lovable big teddy bear. Please welcome Ryan. Good morning. Can you guys hear me okay? It's my first time using this portable microphone, so it makes me more mobile, so my Portuguese side can really express itself. <laughs> Happy Halloween, everybody. Thank you, folks, for having me, and thank you, folks, for coming to a very important topic that's near and dear to my heart. I've spent many, many years fighting cancer in people. What we're trying to shift to now is preventing cancer so that you don't ever have to see surgery or radiation or chemotherapy, which can have side effects and toxicities. So the topic today is going to be cancer screening. How can we try to get to the person and to the situation sooner to hopefully prevent complications down the road? Okay? So the first question we have to ask ourselves is, well, what is screening? And there's many different screens in this world, but unfortunately the screening we're talking about today is to look for cancer. If a person is having a problem or a symptom, bleeding, chest pain, trouble breathing, a breast lump, that's no longer screening because that's a symptom. That's something we need to now figure out and diagnose. Screening is the process that we utilize in somebody who's not having any symptoms or not having any problems. Someone who feels well, is living life and loving life, and doesn't even know that they have a problem. So it's interventions to get to these people, the people who are feeling really well, before they have a problem. The goal, like I said, is early detection. Can we find something so early before it can spread or before it can cause more damage or issues or problems? Early intervention, if we can find it early, will often lead to an increase in the ability to solve the problem, catching it early, preventing it early, and treating it early. What we have to remember is, again, screening is an asymptomatic individual. So if you or a loved one is having a symptom or a problem, that's a different situation. So the, what we're talking about here is in somebody who's feeling well. We have to, this presentation is only going to focus on people who are considered average risk. There's many factors in a person that can increase their risk. A family history of cancer, a personal history of cancer, radiation exposure, etc. We're not talking about the high-risk people because they're in a separate category and their screening is done a little bit more aggressively and in different intervals. We're just talking about the run-of-the-mill person living their life again, and we're going to be introducing some screening uh, concepts today. We're going to be focusing on some of the big guys, the ones that we have data on. Um, breast cancer, lung cancer, cervical cancer, prostate cancer, and colorectal cancer. So we have a lot of things to cover. We're going to start off with lung cancer. This is an x-ray of somebody who, again, was asymptomatic, not having any problems, no cough, no coughing up blood, no shortness of breath. But they had to get a chest x-ray because they had been hit by a baseball or a football or something, and so they were having some rib discomfort. So they go in for their chest x-ray, and lo and behold, the chest x-ray finds something unexpected. Lung cancer is a bad actor. Lung cancer is one of the most common cancers we have in the United States and the world. And unfortunately, it's linked to some of the highest mortality, meaning cause of death is the cancer itself. So as you can see, in 2013, there's about 220,000 new cases of lung cancer diagnosed and 160,000 lung cancer-associated deaths. Those are staggering numbers and very high numbers. And is there anything we can do to try and bring those numbers down? You hear about the quit smoking campaign and all those sorts of things, and they're phenomenal and they're awesome. But we're all talking about, again, screening in this situation. 75% of patients have symptoms, but by the time they have symptoms, the cancer's advanced, the cancer's spread, the cancer's big, it's compressing something or pushing up against something. So is there anything we can do to try and intervene sooner? When you look at all comers, the five-year overall survival, so the chance of you surviving five years after having been diagnosed with your cancer, if you look at all comers, it's only 16%. Again, that's abysmal, and we need to try and figure out ways to try and increase these numbers. If you're a stage one lung cancer, and these stages just go into the aggressiveness of the cancer and how widespread it is, et cetera, 
you have about a 60% chance of making it five years, which is pretty good. But if you're stage four, you have less than 5% chance of making it five years due to the cancer itself. So again, we need to come up with ways to get involved sooner. For decades, a lot of physicians thought, well, what if we just get chest x-rays on everybody and we see if we can find those spots? A lot of studies were done and it actually showed no benefit. The x-rays just were not sensitive enough. They were not finding things sooner than we wanted them to be. So the chest x-ray issue has kind of been poo-pooed and put to the side. It wasn't finding any significant mortality benefit. However, fairly recently, we did have an advancement. Chest CT scans or CAT scans came about and were becoming much more popular. So a big study was done called the National Lung Screening Trial where they looked at annual CT scans versus chest x-rays. There was some caveats. It was men and women. The age category was 55 to 74. You could be a current or former smoker. The former smoker, though, is you had to quit within 15 years. If you quit before 15 years, so 25, 30, 35 years ago, you were not included in this trial. So it had to be fairly recent people who quit. And they had to have a pretty significant smoking history, so 30 pack years. Pack years means the number of packs you smoke times the number of years that you smoked for. So a 30 pack year smoker could be two packs per day for 15 years, or it can be one pack per day for 30 years. So it's just depending on how you do the math and how many packs per day you smoke. So these people had a significant smoking history. What did it show us? Well, the trials actually stopped early because they did an interim analysis that showed that CT scans or CAT scans had benefit. We were finding cancer soon. Well, I shouldn't say that. We were finding things sooner, and further workup ultimately led to cancers. We were finding spots when they were so small. We were finding lumps in lungs when they were still confined and had not spread. So when they compared it to chest x-rays, they definitely found more cancers. As you can see, 1,000 cancers in the CT scan group versus 572 cancers in the chest X-ray group. So about double. When we looked at the mortality, there was a 20% less chance of dying from the cancer if found early on the CAT scan. Yeah? So finally, finally, we had some data and we had some input to show that we could make an impact with this bad cancer, right? So nowadays, your PCPs, or your primary care physicians, should be promoting this if you fit into the categories that was studied. However, and there's always a however, there's always downsides to our screenings as well. What you have to remember is pictures are just pictures, right? So the CT scan can find an abnormality, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the abnormality is cancer, right? It could be a cyst, it could be scar tissue, it could be old infection, whatever. So the, if the CT scan finds something, it's gonna lead to more testing either something called a PET scan or something called a bronchoscopy where the lung doctor puts the camera down into the airway to try and biopsy. Or it might lead to MRIs or whatever, but it might lead to further testing to get to the issue. Is this truly a cancer that we're seeing? And there are some people who have what's called a false positive, meaning the CT scan found something, further workup did not lead to the diagnosis of cancer, right? But they had to be put through the stress, the anxiety of possibly having cancer. They have to be put through the biopsy and the preparation for it. So there's downsides to our screening as well. But the chance of us finding that cancer early with this 20% mortality impact, many physicians are finding it to be worthwhile to do that. Okay? So the conclusions. CT scans are more sensitive than chest x-rays. Absolutely, CAT scans will find more things. The question is, is it cancer or not? And we have to do more testing. It does lead to decreased mortality, that 20% mortality decrease due to cancer. The false positive rates, however, like I said, the CT scan will find something. The question is, what is it finding? There can be false positives. So you might get yourself worked up over this spot on the lung that may not turn out to be cancer, but that would be spectacular as well, right? <clears throat> and then again, that lower mortality rate, that benefit of 20%. The first real conclusive data that we have in this population of people. So I don't want everybody to start going asking their doctors for CAT scans, of course. But it's only in the population 55 to 80 with a 30-pack year history at least and quitting within 15 years or current smokers with heavy-pack year history. The reason that they stop, uh, stop greater than 15 years is because the chance of developing lung cancer in a smoker who stopped, let's say, 40 years ago is almost equivalent to a non-smoker. 
it will never be the same as a non-smoker, but it'll be decreased to the point where they're basically equivalent. And that's why they put that 15-year hard stop category on the CT scans. More research is being done, of course. Should we start younger? Should we keep going older? Should we expand the number of pack years? Should we say, if you stopped within 25 years, we can still scan you? So the research is still being done. But at least at this moment in time, we have some good data to show that we can make an impact. And this is life-saving for many people. Moving on from lung cancer, breast cancer, another bad cancer with a high mortality rate. The average lifetime risk for a woman in the United States to develop lung cancer, of, uh, breast cancer of some sort, is about 10 to 15 percent. So some people say about 12 percent average. In 2011, there was 230,000 new cases of breast cancer, invasive breast cancer, not non-invasive, and there's a difference there. The invasive component is the one that can grow and spread and threaten a person's life. Non-invasive, if you get to it early enough, we should be able to prevent that. So we're focusing on the invasive breast cancers. There's about 40,000 deaths per year from breast cancer, or breast cancer-associated problems. Recent data suggests mortality has decreased from previous decades, and a large part of physicians and studies will tell you that it's due to screening. We're going to, again, stratify people into average risk or high risk, and the purpose of today's talk will just talk about the average risk person, men and females as well. High-risk women, or males too, would be previous thoracic radiation, so chest radiation from any kind of treatment before. The older we get, if you have a family history of breast or ovarian cancer, a prior history of breast cancer, a prior history of something called LCIS, which is lobular carcinoma in situ, again, a non-invasive form of breast cancer, or if you have something called atypical hyperplasia, which again is not breast cancer, but it could be a precursor. But again, these are the high-risk people, which we're not going to be focusing on. So screening in breast cancer, the mammogram. The mammogram is not a favorite technique of many of my patients. However, <laughs> it is definitely life-changing and life-saving, and it's definitely recommended. On the left side is a normal mammogram, normal contour to the breast, no abnormal findings, masses, etc. The middle one is sees what ultimately was found to be a benign cyst. Very smooth, very round, does not look irregular. And the far right is ultimately a finding that was found to be cancer. As you can see, it's thicker, it's denser, it has irregular margins, it just looks more angry than the middle picture. So the mammogram definitely has had benefits. In average risk individuals, age 20 to 39, Many groups will recommend what's called a clinical breast exam. So a breast exam by your physician, whether it be your gynecologist or your primary care physician, as well as promoting breast awareness in men and women, right? Get to know your breast, and you're going to understand the size and the shape and the feel of it better than anybody. So you're going to be sometimes the first to detect that there's an abnormality or a change or something is different, you know? There's been no, no randomized trials have really been done pointing to screening in women less than 40. And the reason is because the risk of developing, in an average risk individual, developing breast cancer in less than 40 is not very high. But also, mammograms have a limitation. They're basically fancy x-rays. Younger women and males have very dense or thick breasts. So the chance of the mammogram seeing something on it is, is harder. The mammogram has a harder time picking up abnormalities in denser breasts. If you're 40 or over to question mark, question mark, question mark, meaning we don't know when we should stop doing mammograms yet, the recommendation is for annual clinical breast exams as well as screening mammograms yearly. There is some controversy between certain groups, which we'll talk about in a second, about whether or not you should do a mammogram every year or every two years. And then the question, of course, is when do we stop? If you look at some of the original mammogram studies, they stopped in women about 65 to 70. The problem is, obviously, older men and women get breast cancer as well, but that's just how the studies were designed. That was the population that they were targeting. If the person has severe comorbid conditions, so whether it be hmm, critical heart disease, that the next heart attack could, you know, could end their life, or a debilitating stroke where they're bed-bound, etc., if they have other life-limiting diseases, then many physicians will say, hey, we're not even going to look for breast cancer in this situation because you wouldn't be able to tolerate any intervention should we even find the cancer. You would not survive the surgery. Chemotherapy would 
completely ruin your quality of life, etc. So there are reasons to stop screening sooner. Several trials do show, again, a 15% reduction of breast cancer mortality in women 39 to 48. And again, larger benefit in older women because of the fact that the breasts are less dense. So the mammogram can see abnormalities easier. It can pick out if something looks funny or abnormal. Again, over the age of 70, because the studies weren't really geared for this, we don't truly know the magnitude of the benefit. But if you extrapolate from, from younger data populations, there must be a benefit. Shorter life expectancy decreases the chances of screening to prolong life. Again, the studies are limited, and it's a moving target. So I'm seeing primary care physicians do mammograms in women who are 90, 95 years old, because their mentally excellent physical performance status is amazing. So age is just a number. It shouldn't be the main reason you don't do screening. You kind of need to look at the patient and the person as a whole and figure out, should you do the screening? Because if you find something, is this person healthy enough for us to do something about it? Yeah? So age by itself should not be the limiting factor. So mammograms, do they work? And the short answer is yes. Studies have shown overall 75% sensitivity of finding something abnormal in the breast itself, but approximately 50% in, again, younger women with denser breasts. And it has been proven to decrease mortality. If we find an abnormal spot sooner, we act upon it sooner. And if it is cancer, the hope is we catch it sooner. There is an update in the technology. Our technology is getting better. So we have conventional mammograms versus digital mammograms. And most hospitals here in Hawaii are definitely moving towards, in fact, I think they all might be digital by now. So again, moving towards digital, large studies have shown no major difference in accuracy, but they may be better in detecting in younger women with denser breasts. So here on the right, you see a conventional mammogram. It's kind of hazy. There's a lot of white out to it. But the radiologist, and I am not a radiologist, but the radiologist can look at this and say, no significant abnormalities. On the left is a digital mammogram of the same breast. As you can see, it's just much better quality, much easier to see through the breast and see if there's any major abnormalities or any funny spots or areas. This is a picture of an ultrasound on a mammogram that had an abnormality. So if an abnormality is seen on the mammogram, again, just like the CT scan for lung cancer, it doesn't mean that the spot is cancer. It just means it looks funny and we need to do something about it. So the next step is often an ultrasound, and this, is an, this turned out to be cancer ultimately. It's a spot that shouldn't be there. It has this thing called posterior shadowing, irregular edges around it, and this thing had to be biopsy because it looked very suspicious. And unfortunately, it came out to be cancer. But fortunately, caught quite early, and the patient was ultimately cured of her cancer. So again, what if a mass is found on examination or a mammogram? You get your mammograms, the ultrasound to confirm, and if still suspicious, you need that tissue. You need to confirm that it is cancer. So, what do the experts say? And there's many groups out there that have differing opinions. Age to start screening. The American, uh, I'll get to them in a second. That's why I put them with an underline. American Cancer Society, the College of Radiology, the American Medical Association, the National Cancer Institute, the American College of Gynecology, and the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. A lot of alphabet soup up there. These are all professional groups that have made recommendations regarding breast cancer screening. They all recommend starting at the age of 40 as a baseline, except these guys. Anybody read the paper last week? Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about them in a second. Um, but in general, the recommendations start at 40. Frequency. Many experts will still say yearly in younger women with denser breasts because, again, the chance of finding something is harder, so you want to watch them more frequently to make sure nothing is changing or popping up at the time. And then as we get older and the breasts get less dense, where it's easier to see an abnormality, then you can change it to every other year. Controversy. The United States Preventive, Ta the United States Preventive Health Task Force. In 2009, they came out with their position statement that was a little bit different than all those other groups. They said they recommend against mammograms in women less than 50. They hedge, though, by saying that it should be an individual choice based on risks or benefits discussed with your physician. 
So they still give that out if the physician and the patient feel that less than 50, they should get a mammogram, but they recommend it against it. Age 50 to 74, they send mammograms every other year, and they actually recommend against breast self-exams in women and men in terms of your own examination to detect an abnormality. They felt that too many people were finding things that we do this extensive workup that ultimately was nothing. So that's why they recommend breast awareness and not necessarily a self-breast exam. So why? They say women in their 40s and 50s benefit equally from screening mammograms, but women in the 40s experience greater harms from screening than women in their 50s. Again, it's harder to tease out something. So a radiologist might call more abnormalities in a denser breast because they can't see it as well, so they're just nervous, they're unsure. Could it be something truly abnormal or not? It's always safer in their world to call something than not so that we can do further workup on it. Radiation exposure, false positives, false negatives, overdiagnosis, pain from the procedures, anxiety, distress, and other psychological responses were all reasons why the USPSTF recommended against mammograms in the younger age group less than 50. The American Cancer Society came out with a new position statement. Women with a personal, so for average risk women, right? But women with a personal history of breast cancer, family history of breast cancer, genetic mutation called the BRCA mutation, <clears throat> history of ovarian cancer, women with previous radiation exposure, these are not average risk women. These are high risk women. So the position statement does not apply to those people. It said women age 40 to 44 should have the choice to start annual breast cancer screening with mammograms if they wish to do so. Okay. The risks of screening as well as the potential benefits should be considered and discussed with your physician. So they're not recommending a mammogram starting at that age, but they're saying, hey, if you want to or if you're thinking about it, talk to your physician about it. And it's not necessarily wrong, but we're not going to recommend it. If you're 45 to 54, then they say you should, and you're getting the mammogram starting less than 50, then you should get mammograms every year. Again, younger women, denser breasts, more, scre more frequent evaluation. Older women, 55 and older, should switch to mammograms every other year. And here they hedge again, or have the choice to continue yearly screening. I'm like, what are you doing to me? <laughs> you know? So they came out with a new position statement. It's not crystal clear, but it is their current recommendations. Screening should continue as long as a woman is in good health and is expected to live longer than 10 years or more. So there's no upper age limit. Like old position statements from decades ago used to tell you 70, stop, 75, stop. But people are living longer and living healthier. So why should we put a hard stop on it? Why should women over the age of 70 not get screened? So they throw in this caveat that said, as long as they're in good health, with a long life expectancy to be able to tolerate our treatments, then we can continue screening in those women. All women should be familiar with the known benefits, limitations, and potential harms associated with breast cancer screening. So again, like that USPSTF position statement, the stress, the anxiety, the pain of procedures, et cetera, is something that should be factored into the decision, should we start screening mammograms or not earlier. <clears throat> and again, they talk about breast awareness or breast education. Should be familiar with how their breasts normally look and feel and report any changes to a health provider right away. But they stop short of calling it a self-breast examination. Okay. Moving on from breast cancer to another GYN type cancer, cervical cancer. Not as common as the previous two cancers that we discussed, 12,000 cases per year and about 4,000 will die from disease each year. However, this is one of the first cancers that showed screening has made a major impact in mortality from cervical cancer. If you look at ledgers from like 1800s, and it wasn't necessarily called cervical cancer per se, but it was one of the higher actual causes of mortality in women. Right? We weren't finding cervical cancer early enough, so by the time we found it, it was spread. And by the time it spreads, there's not much we can do. So they came up with the pap smear. Screening has detected precursor lesions in early cancers and led to earlier treatment, and this has definitely, definitely decreased mortality in women compared to the past. The pap smear. It's a swab that collects cellular material from the cervix, and the sample is tested, and it looks for atypical cells. The pap smear itself may not be able to diagnose the cancer directly, but just like our other screening purposes, it finds something funny. It finds something abnormal that needs to be looked into a little bit more. So it started in the 1950s, and by the 1980s, the incidence of cervical cancer decreased by 70%. 
I mean, that's a huge number compared to the past. So this is one of the first examples in, in cancer world of screening leading to a big impact. Again, it sees these abnormal cells, but the need for a biopsy for, defini for definitive diagnosis is often needed. More recently, you may have been seeing in, in Time magazine and all these things about this thing called HPV, or the human papillomavirus. It's one of the first viruses described as oncogenic, meaning the virus itself can actually lead to the cancer. So we have fancy testing for it that determines if the person is infected with the offending virus. And there's many different types of HPV. The two main types that are cancer-causing is type 16 and type 18. So now a lot of gynecologists, when they do the pap smear, if they feel the person's high risk, they're sending out this HPV test. So when to start? 21 years of age, and then as every three years until they're 30, assuming that the results are negative, of course. If you're over the age of 30, they say you can do a pap smear every three to five years and checking for high-risk HPV every five years. So, and this is fairly new in the past few years. HPV typing has just been kind of included into the recommendations as the, the technology was developing. <clears throat> so again, they proved that this HPV, this human papillomavirus, is responsible for a majority of the cervical cancers. And when you combine it with the cytology, which is the actual pap smear itself, it can increase the detection of precancers. It can increase the power and the ability to find these cancers early. When to stop. And again, the when to stop for all of our screening is nebulous. We don't really have great data to tell us when. Some recommend between 65 and 70 and three consecutive and negative tests and no history of abnormal tests in the previous 10 years and no new sexual partners, which increases the risk of HPV infection again. Yeah? So as you can see, they, it's not necessarily 65 to 70, you're stopping, right? It's kind of a guideline that if you fit all of these criteria, you may not need to be tested at that point because your risk of developing cervical cancer at that point in time is lower. Doesn't mean zero, but it means lower. And then, of course, if you have no new sexual partners, you should not be introducing the HPV virus at that point in time. And therefore, if you hit these criteria, then the recommendation is you can consider stopping at that point in time. Moving on. Colon or colorectal cancer. Another example of how screening has decreased mortality significantly. It's the third most common cancer and the second leading cause of cancer death. Approximately 150,000 new cases per year and about 50,000 deaths per year from, it, from colon cancer. Early diagnosis can decrease mortality. We've proven that. The lifetime risk is approximately 5%. And again, average risk people. Proven that screening decreases mortality. It's unfortunate that like the pap smear, the screening technique is no fun. Many cancer arise from polyps. So that again, just like for the pap smear looking for atypical things, the colonoscopy will look for atypical polyps that can be removed or sampled to see if there's cancer there. In 2012, only 65% of those between 15 and 75 were up to date with their screening, and 28% said they had never been screened before. So there's different options. Structural screening. So your friendly colonoscopy is considered the gold standard. Some doctors are doing sigmoidoscopies, which are kind of like partial colonoscopies, where it sees the lower end of your GI tract, and they couple it with fecal occult blood testing, where you do those stool cards, where they look for blood on it. <clears throat> you don't need sedation for the flexible sigmoidoscopy. It's a faster procedure, but again, the trade-off is only visualizes a small portion of the colon. It doesn't go all the way around. We have this new thing called a virtual colonoscopy. It's not bad at detecting lesions, but the lesions have to be greater than a centimeter, so there's a size limitation. Also, if you find it, then what? You gotta have the colonoscopy anyway, because you gotta go in there and sample it. <laughs> so you might as well just do the colonoscopy, because <laughs> if they find something abnormal, you can sample it right there and you don't have to have two procedures. So that's my own personal bias. Again, personal bias. <laughs> Fecal based studies. So again, the structural studies are the ones where they look for the abnormality, right? The gastroenterologist can directly visualize the colon. Is there any funny tissue, any funny polyps? Biopsy it, remove it, etc. Fecal base is where they try to look for, again, abnormal cells and stuff in the stool, but it doesn't look for the precancerous polyps. The fecal occult blood testing doesn't have a high sensitivity, meaning if there's blood in the stool, it doesn't mean it's cancer. It could be a hemorrhoid. It could be a fissure. It could be irritation. It could be colitis. It could be something you ate. 
I think beets cause a false positive on fecal coat blood testing. So it's not the best test, but it is kind of a consideration. And then there's studies ongoing about this new thing called stool DNA testing, where they're actually breaking down the stool and looking at the cells that are in the stool and analyzing the DNA to see if they can detect cancerous DNA in the stool study. It's kind of not ready for prime time yet, but it is something that may be less invasive than colonoscopies, and maybe it is the wave of the future. But at this moment in time, the recommendation is to not include it. So if average risk, when do we start? The global recommendation is 50. And again, the option is colonoscopy every 10 years. And I say that every 10 years because it's kind of a ballpark. If you have a completely normal colonoscopy, the GI doc will say 10 years. If you have like one polyp, they might say five to seven. If you have multiple polyps but they're, that are not cancerous, they might say three to five. So that 10 years is not a hard, fast rule. Don't assume you're going to have a colonoscopy and you're going to have another one in 10 years because that can change just by depending on what they see. But the hope is if you have a completely normal one, it will be a 10-year time frame. You can do annual fecal coat blood testing in combination with the flexible sigmoidoscopy every five years or the virtual colonoscopy every five years. Whatever you choose, any screening is better than no screening. Okay, so if you're worried about the colonoscopy prep or you don't want to undergo anesthesia or whatever the reason may be, choose something. Because again, we've proven that if we catch colon cancer early, we can impact the mortality. USPSTF. Oh, these guys. I really want to meet them and be like, who are you? They recommend screening with a fecal cold blood testing, sigmoidoscopy, or colonoscopy in adults beginning at age 50 and continuing to, until age 75. They recommend against routine cancer screening for colorectal cancer in people over the age of 75. But again, just like in the previous discussion, we need to just not look at the number, right? Because we have people living to 100 now, so, or and even beyond. So why can't we do a colonoscopy in them if they're 80 and they're in good health with no limiting comorbid conditions, just like we talked about before? So again, this is going to be a discussion between yourself, your gastroenterologist, your primary care physician, about the risk versus benefit, you know, depending on the other health issues going on at the time. <clears throat> this is just a picture of a CAT scan of somebody that did ha was having abdominal pain and they came in. So this is normal colon, this is normal colon, and this is colon that's being squeezed super tight. So the contrast material is having a hard time getting through it. This is what's called an apple core lesion because it kind of looks like an apple core. Uh, this was ultimately biopsy, did turn out to be cancer. Luckily for this patient, it was an early stage cancer. This was not found, of course, because of screening, because they were having the symptom of the tummy pain. This was found because of the symptom that led to the diagnosis. Yeah. This is a picture in a, during a colonoscopy of actually seeing an abnormal polyp. This patient, this was biopsy, you know, was removed in the colonoscopy and was not found to be cancerous, thank goodness. But there was potential for it to be, which is why we do the screening to look for these lesions. This is an example of a polyp seen on the virtual colonoscopy. So even if you see a polyp, though, they can't do anything about it. You're going to have to have the colonoscopy anyway. All right? So again, I'm throwing personal bias in there. But I prefer to just have one procedure as opposed to two, because if the gastroenterologist sees something, they can do something about it right away. Prostate cancer. OK. <clears throat> in 2015, there's approximately 220,000 cases going to be diagnosed. There's about 28,000 deaths per year. It's the most commonly diagnosed cancer in men behind skin cancer and the second leading cause of cancer death in men behind lung cancer. Put it a different way, you have about a 1 in 6% chance of being diagnosed with this and a 1 in 30 chance of dying from the actual prostate cancer itself. So, should every gentleman have a PSA check? PSA stands for prostate-specific antigen. It's a blood test. It's a protein that circulates in the blood that's made by prostate tissues. The higher the number, the suspicion is that there's prostate cancer there. But there's a number of things that can cause elevated PSAs, which is why PSA has been under fire recently about is it a good screening tool. And the data on it is not spectacular. So some docs are doing it. Uh, many docs are doing it. Some docs are not doing it. Men who get regular PSA screening are at a higher risk of getting a biopsy and determining if they have cancer. 
And this edict is true for any of our screening. That's the point of screening, right? If you find an abnormality, you need to further assess it. So unfortunately for the prostate, there's no great way of assessing it except doing a biopsy. So if the PSA is extraordinarily abnormal, you're going to get shipped off to the urologist who can do the biopsy. So of course, if you check a PSA, you're going to find things and you're going to have to look into it a little bit more. But unfortunately, it doesn't make uh, it's not as clear cut as do we just check a blood test. 50 is a traditional starting point for men. Studies will, again, for average risk individuals, not having symptoms, et cetera. If the person's having the difficult urination or blood in the urine, again, that's not screening anymore. That's a symptom that needs to be assessed. So that's more diagnosis. So again, this is an average risk gentleman without any symptoms. Some studies will suggest checking a baseline PSA between the age of 45 to 49. African-American men and men with a family history of prostate cancer probably should be started earlier. There's been multiple epidemiologic studies to show that, family, that prostate cancer can be seen in families, and African-American men tend to get prostate cancer more frequently at an earlier age, and so they should be looked at in a little bit different light. PSA of 4 has been the traditional cutoff. However, uh, more recent data is showing us that there should be an age factor into the PSA. The older you are, you might be allowed a little bit higher of a PSA. But for the purpose of our discussion today, we're going to just look at 4 as our cutoff. 30 to 35% of men, if they have a PSA between 4 to 10, will be found to ultimately have cancer. So as you can see, the number is not extraordinarily high in terms of 30 35%. But it is one of the only tests for screening purposes for prostate cancer that we currently have. There are some studies that are suggesting to decrease that PSA number to three. Because if we call three abnormal, you're going to biopsy more men to see if we can capture more prostate cancer early. But again, the lower you drop the number, the more biopsies are going to be done, the more false positives you're going to have, the more cancer you will not find. But you will capture some, of course. But again, it's controversial. NCCN, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, they agree with this level. And obviously, if you have an abnormal DRE, what's called the digital rectal exam, where the physician uses their finger as the instrument, they, if they find an abnormality at any PSA level, needs to be evaluated sooner. So even if the PSA looks normal, but on examination the prostate is abnormal, you have to look into it. There's risk to biopsy, just like we talked about for other conditions, infection, bleeding, anxiety, pain, et cetera. If you do find prostate cancer, of course, there's risk to the treatment. There's risk to surgery. There's risk to radiation. Uh, death in less than 1% of people, erectile dysfunction, urinary incontinence are just some of the complications of the actual treatment. So just like with the other conditions, you need to look at the person as a whole. Are they healthy enough to be able to undergo the testing, the treatment, et cetera, et cetera? The NCCN will tell you you need to discuss the pros and cons of the biopsy or the PSA testing with your physician. Baseline rectal exam and a PSA at between the age of 45 and 49. Assuming that the rectal exam is normal, okay? PSA less than one, they'll say retest at 50 because it looks pretty good. PSA greater than one but less than three, they'll say get an annual recheck. And a PSA greater than three, they'll say consider biopsy. Regular screening starting at the age of 50 and ending around 70. But again, that's not a hard and fast number. It kind of depends on the global health and picture of the person. And then consider stopping at 75, but discuss this with the patient. The reason is if you diagnose the prostate cancer over the age of 75, your risk of dying from the prostate cancer is a little bit less than dying of something else. Getting hit by a car, heart attack. I mean, there's other reasons why you might pass away over the age of 75, and it may not be linked to the cancer. So again, we have to look at the big picture, the global health of the person and the situation, and the upper age limits before we decide how aggressive we're going to be with it. All groups discuss the, or stress the importance of education and informed decision making as the basis of determining your next steps. You and your physician need to have a sit-down discussion about, should I get this test, and what's the ramifications going to be? If it's positive, what are the next steps? Do I want to do it? If it's negative, what do we do after that? And they need to tell you the pluses and minuses, pros and cons of each step of the screening process for any of the cancer conditions. The risks, there are risks to any study or any testing that we do, including biopsies. And a small reduction in mortality in certain situations, but in other cancers, like we talked about, significant reductions in mortality. 
Thank you guys very much.